Okay, it looks like the majority of people are either in or still coming in from the waiting room. So we'll go ahead and get started. You know, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual version of our wine school with Father John Sawicki, featuring wines from the regions of the Spirit and Founders. During the session today, he'll review these wines and share a little bit of history about the Spirit as well. I'm Jonathan Ogorchak. I'm the president of the Duquesne Alumni Board of Governors and your moderator for the program here this evening. I'm so pleased to have so many registrants for this program tonight from all over the country. You know, we've been hearing a lot of good feedback and we're excited that you're able to join us here tonight. I encourage those of you that are gathering groups and safely, might I add, uh, to be sure to share some pictures to um, an email address, which we're going to share in the chat. Uh, of you enjoying each other's company and enjoying all of uh, you know, the wines and pairings here this evening. Now, before we jump into the introduction of Father Swicky, I'd like to take a moment to thank Duquesne University's executive chef, Tim Fetter, for providing the suggested food pairings for you here tonight. I'd also like to thank the alumni engagement team for arranging this program. Uh, Audrey Tierney, she's the Associate Director for Alumni Engagement, and Sarah Sperry, the AVP of Alumni Engagement, will be managing the technical aspects of the program behind the scenes here tonight. Now, throughout the presentation, your microphones are going to be muted, but you're welcome to submit questions or comments through the chat feature found on the toolbar here on the bottom of your screen. Questions that are received through the chat will be addressed time permitting following the presentation. And in case you didn't get a chance to print out Father Sawicki's tasting notes to follow along, Audrey will be putting a link to those notes in the chat for you. Also, this program is being recorded and will be sent to you in a few days via email. So if you choose to open some of your bottles later on, you will have this program to refer back to. Now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our presenter. Many of you know Father John Sawicki as one of our on-campus spirit and priests. Father Sawicki is also an assistant professor of political science and director of the Center for International Relations here at Duquesne. He holds his PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and teaches national security courses in political science and international relations at Duquesne. He has lectured on counter-terror finance and religious violence topics at the George C. Marshall Center for European Security in Germany, as well as other U.S. Embassy and military command venues in the world. And for those of you that are joining us from outside of the Pittsburgh area and haven't had a chance to join us in person for one of these wine tastings with Father, you're in for a real treat here this evening. So Father John, I'm going to turn the program over to you and we'll talk with you more at the end of the program. Thanks, Jonathan, and uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, I would echo your comments uh, of thanks to the uh, Alumni Affairs Office, which have done so much to make uh, this particular event possible and have done it really in such a spectacular way. Our evening tonight is uh, to look at uh, some of the, the wines that are representative from uh, areas that are part of uh, our own spirits and history. And uh, because of that, uh, we uh, cover primarily France tonight uh, because uh, that is where the congregation is founded. But uh, more directly, uh, we'll have the chance to taste uh, and to learn uh, more deeply some really delicious wines and have some sense of the context uh, that makes them so good. Our beginning uh, shows this particular uh, slide where we have a, a, a picture of our generalate on Cleva de China in Rome. Uh, you can uh, stand uh, at the top there and uh, look out through some of those garret windows, which are barely visible. Uh, that's where visitors stay. Um, and you can see the dome of uh, St. Peter's uh, illuminated at night uh, when it's particularly beautiful. Uh, the congregation's uh, founded in France, but uh, like most religious orders, it has an administration which is uh, centered in Rome, uh, though we speak of our mother house, which is located in Paris. What we're going to do tonight is review uh, a little bit of the history of the congregation of the Holy Spirit, um, otherwise known as the Spiritans, and then uh, as we uh, learn a little bit about uh, the founding and now sponsoring congregation of Duquesne University, uh, we'll also uh, be able to pick up a little acumen about the, the wines that uh, were typical for them. So for tonight, what we'll do is have a short primer on the Spiritans, otherwise known as the Holy Ghost Fathers. Uh, if you're uh, an alumna or an alumnus, uh, from uh, about uh, 40 years or more, you would know us as the Holy Ghost Fathers. Uh, generally, the transition was made to the Spiritans uh, beginning in the 1980s 
because of a variety of circumstances. Uh, chiefly, uh, once when uh, we were submitting our uh, rules and constitutions to the Sacred Congregation of Religious, which you have to do actually uh, on a 10-year basis, uh, the Cardinal in charge of that with the red pen crossed out Holy Ghost and wrote in Holy Spirit. And uh, that was uh, sort of uh, the uh, impetus to make the change, uh, at least uh, in terms of uh, our relations uh, with the public. Spiritans is uh, actually a French word, uh, the French province, which was the largest province in the congregation for almost all of its history, um, called themselves the Spiritans anyway. And uh, that word is the same in just about every language uh, of the 52 countries in the world in which we operate. So this will be a narrative, not a chronology. It's not a history lesson. We're actually using uh, a history lesson for us to learn about wine. But uh, hopefully, uh, while you're learning about wine, you're also going to learn about the work of uh, my congregation and the sponsoring congregation of Duquesne University. So we're matching our wines or our regions, which are linked to the development of the congregation. The picture you see there uh, on the right is a memorial that was erected in 2012 in Bagamoyo, Tanzania, for uh, the uh, general chapter for the Congregation of the Holy Spirit. We have those every eight years where we elect our international leadership, specifically our, spirit, uh, uh, our superior general. And uh, in, in particular, uh, that cross memorializes uh, the uh, many uh, spiritans who have gone to East Africa, uh, in particular Tanganyika. Quite a few of them have come from the United States and quite a few of them were alumni of this university. In fact, our university chaplain today, uh, Father uh, Bill Christie uh, served uh, for many years in Tanzania uh, before coming to the university here. So the Congregation of the Holy Spirit uh, was founded in 1703 by a, a young French nobleman named Claude Poulard de Place. Uh, he is indeed the de Place, uh, for whom de Place Hall is named here, a living and learning center um, that uh, is uh, an, uh, an architecturally uh, award-winning building. He was himself uh, uh, from Brittany um, and uh, was admitted at a very young age. He in fact was 16. Uh, to the bar uh, as an accomplished uh, lawyer uh, and arguments before the French king himself, Louis XIV. In fact, uh, Louis was so impressed uh, by Claude uh, that uh, he gave the congregation a royal charter, which was not common at the time, uh, which would later on prove to be uh, of immeasurable value to us when uh, the uh, French Republic attempted to suppress the Roman Catholic Church in France they were not able to suppress the Spiritans because uh, the charter for the uh, Spiritans um, actually had been issued by the government itself. Unfortunately, uh, Claude's congregation, the Congregation of the Holy Spirit, under the protection of the Holy Heart of Mary, will uh, be shattered by the French Revolution, reduced uh, to three priests, and it never really recovers. But it has that legal protection and it has uh, significant property in France. So uh, in 1848, the Vatican suggested that uh, a new congregation, which was founded uh, by a uh, convert uh, to the uh, Roman Catholic faith, Francis Lieberman in 1842, be merged and uh, the two congregations be one congregation under the name of the older congregation. His congregation was called the Congregation of the Holy Heart of Mary, under the protection of the Holy Spirit. So uh, they were virtually the same in terms of particular charism and uh, uh, ideals. So with, uh, with that sort of background, uh, let's uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the first of, of our wines, but uh, to do that, we need to talk about uh, the province of Alsace in France. Um, that's in the, uh, in, the, in the east. In fact, it's the easternmost uh, province in France. Uh, it was a place that uh, the, uh, the, the Germans and the French would uh, go to war over uh, pretty much like clockwork one to four times every century. So uh, when uh, Father Lieberman is born there, uh, he is born there uh, when it is a uh, part of France. Later on, uh, after a defeat, uh, it will switch uh, to Germany again. In any case, uh, he's born in 1802 uh, and uh, he dies in 1852. 
Uh, he's, the, he's the son of the uh, rabbi of Severn, which is a beautiful uh, and picturesque village uh, in uh, Alsace. You can see it there. Um, when he's in Yeshiva, he loses his faith. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, he regains uh, uh, his faith in a different way. This time, uh, he uh, is baptized in 1826 and uh, spends uh, much of his life seeking to be ordained a Catholic priest and going so far as to uh, found his own congregation. Uh, he dies in 1852. We're lucky to actually have a photograph of him, which uh, were just at that time becoming uh, possible because of the spread of that technology. You see that uh, in the lower right-hand side. And uh, Canadian Spiritans coming from Ireland uh, founded uh, Lieberman Catholic High School in Toronto about 60 years ago. Uh, Severn is famous, uh, amongst other reasons, for having uh, a, an oak tree, which is uh, over 500 years old. Um, uh, the Congregation of the Holy Spirit, founded in 1703, is not over 500 years old, uh, but uh, we have at least been able to break the 300-year uh, mark. And uh, former President Doherty uh, of the university here uh, put up a beautiful uh, tercentenary or tricentenary memorial uh, to the congregation uh, right here on the campus. So we're, <clears throat> we're talking about Alsace because our first wine comes from Alsace. And uh, the province of Alsace is, uh, is viewable uh, right there uh, as the uh, emboldened red shows you. And uh, the first wine that we have, if you were able to purchase it, is uh, it's, it's, it's a live wine as distinguished from a still wine. In other words, it's sparkling. Um, and uh, generally, when we think of sparkling wines, we think of champagne, or if we were to pronounce it correctly, but I think it would be pretentious, champagne. So champagne is uh, perhaps the most famous sparkling wine in the world, and uh, almost by association, we call all sparkling wines champagne. But legally, and perhaps properly, that uh, is uh, not permitted, at least in the European Union. So instead, when a wine is produced according to the style of, of a champagne, it's, uh, it's said to be produced by méthode traditionnelle, uh, which are uh, effectively the same ways one produces champagne, but you can only have something which is a champagne if it comes from the champagne region in France, which is uh, somewhat to the center north of the map of France there. Uh, generally, a champagne uh, or méthode traditionnelle is uh, going to be produced uh, utilizing at least two fermentation processes. It'll be the original alcoholic fermentation process that gives us wine, and then a secondary process, uh, malolactic fermentation, which uh, sometimes allows it to have a, um, a buttery taste to it. Uh, you get that uh, lactic acid uh, in milk, as well as, uh, ironically, in uh, wines. Uh, we're not going to have that in this wine tonight because uh, of reasons we'll talk about in a moment, but uh, it certainly does have at least a double fermentation process. Generally, uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, live wines uh, are very delicate. Uh, they're, they're not the sort of things that you're going to knock back with a pizza, for example, or anything of, uh, of, of bold seasoning, but uh, they have uh, notes of delicate fruit and fresh yeast. Uh, some people uh, can't drink them uh, because of the fizziness, uh, but uh, most people find them uh, really uh, very pleasant and delightful. Um, we're talking about a Cremant d'Alsace, which is literally uh, a cream from Alsace. Uh, and that's, that's how they describe their sparkling wines. Uh, and in fact, it uh, is one of the best uh, alternatives to champagne that I think you could possibly find. Uh, anytime you can pick up a Cremant, um, I think uh, you're probably going to have a very, very nice experience. And uh, frankly, at uh, likely uh, a quarter to a third of a bottle of good champagne. Uh, they're widely employed as an aperitif. Uh, you go over to someone's house uh, and uh, they'll serve you a glass of that right out of, uh, right out of the arrival. Uh, or there may be uh, some uh, light snacks or something, hors d'oeuvres and uh, you'll have the Cremant served along with that. So let's talk about our wine tonight. Um, it's uh, a Blanc de Noir, uh, it's a Brut, 
and uh, it's uh, Cremant de la Sasse. It comes from uh, the, uh, an association of producers, hence the name Cav, from Bablenheim in Alsace. So in Alsace, they speak uh, Alsatian, uh, which is uh, uh, really, frankly, German with uh, local dialect thrown in, as well as French. So uh, you'll come across almost all the names of the towns there are going to be, have uh, very German sounding names. Indeed, even the architecture obviously is uh, already uh, clearly uh, from Southern Germany. In any case, uh, the Bablenheim Association of Growers was formed in uh, 1952 uh, from over 150 different wine growers, all very small. They would have been just small family farms which were, were producing grapes. And traditionally, many of them would bottle their own wine, but uh, it was very hard to market it. And uh, you never had large enough production for anyone to want to buy it in quantity to sell. So uh, uh, in an effort to try to increase production and also uh, increase quality of production, uh, this consortium was formed. You can see a, a photo from uh, its uh, origin in 1952 there in the upper right-hand side. Um, I, the, the headquarters of the Bablenheim Consortium uh, is, uh, is seen right there in the lower right-hand side. Uh, recently, they were accredited for uh, having high quality, uh, which is an extra standard of uh, performance and of, uh, of perfection that is possible to compete for uh, from the French Wine Marketing Authority. Uh, about 35% of their wine is exported out of France which means uh, about two thirds of it is consumed locally uh, in France. To be really specific, uh, it's consumed uh, in Alsace itself. It's a very good uh, Alsatian wine. So that about the producer. Now let's just talk about the wine itself. Um, uh, it's a Blanc de Noir and it's a Brut. So uh, just a quick primer on those things. When you see that word Brut, uh, uh, B-R-U-T, uh, it indicates that the wine is going to be dry, which is to say this is not going to be a sweet wine. When it says brut, you know that the wine does not have a high degree of sweetness to it. Uh, it would, it's going to taste like a, a standard dry wine. And uh, generally champagne or any sparkling French wine uh, uh, comes in one of two types. It either comes blanc de blanc or it comes blanc de noir. And in the, uh, in the uh, uh, idea of uh, the production of American uh, sparkling wines too, they use this same nomenclature as well, Blanc de Noir and Blanc de, de Blanc. So the difference there is that this wine, which if you're drinking it is very clearly yellowish uh, in color, golden color, uh, this, this comes from red grapes. So you're probably thinking to yourself, how is it possible for me to be drinking a white wine? Cause we're dealing with white wines first. Uh, and uh, it comes from red grapes. Almost certainly, uh, although it's not made uh, explicitly clear uh, in the production notes from the winery, uh, these have to be Pinot Noir grapes. That's really the only red grape that's grown in Alsace. And in any case, uh, a fair number of Champagne, indeed some of the greatest of the Champagnes from the Champagne region are themselves made from not, not just red grapes, but they are made, they're made from Pinot Noir grapes. So uh, that definitely would almost certainly be the grape that's in this particular wine. So how is it that we get a white wine out of red grapes? All wine, all grape juice is clear or, or vaguely tinged with uh, yellow. It only uh, changes color uh, to red if uh, you allow the, the skins to remain with the juice, which is sometimes a reference to uh, resting on its leaves. So uh, if you uh, allow the uh, white wine to stay with uh, its skins over long, you get this uh, almost uh, orangey color that uh, you begin to get. It certainly looks like it's a, a, a very dark yellow and you see that sometimes, which can be confusing uh, because uh, when white wine ages uh, and uh, begins to turn bad, it puts on that color but it could be that the winemaker wanted that color and left the, uh, the green skins in. But uh, when, you, you, when you leave the red skins in, then, um, then, then you get the red color. And the longer you leave them in, the longer, the more deeper and more profound the color. So in this case, uh, this is a wine which is made from a red grape, Pinot Noir, but uh, the, as soon as the grapes uh, are squeezed, 
then uh, that juice is taken away for fermentation and uh, the uh, skins are used uh, for another purpose. So this is aged for at least 12 months uh, before it can be released uh, by regulation, uh, but uh, Babelheim will hold this from two to five years. Uh, this wine, uh, it's not made clear how long it was kept, but I would suggest it's definitely been around uh, for longer than 12 months uh, before it was released to us. There is no year on this uh, wine. Uh, many sparkling wines do not have uh, a year assigned to them uh, because uh, the wine itself uh, may uh, be made in different ways. There are actually three, ways, three ways to make a sparkling wine, which we're not going to go into tonight. And uh, sometimes it's, you, you use grapes from uh, grape juice from, from uh, different years. But um, in the most immediate sense here, um, uh, there's no year and, uh, and that's not unusual for a sparkling wine, at least from France. Uh, but at 12.5% uh, alcohol uh, uh, per unit of volume, uh, this is uh, pretty, uh, pretty strong for uh, a champagne or a, a Cremant d'Alsace. Uh, and it's gotten a rating of 95 points, which frankly uh, is, uh, is uh, pretty sky high for what is uh, in many ways um, otherwise a uh, relatively uh, unknown wine, at least uh, to most Americans. But uh, I always I laser in on uh, uh, Cremant d'Alsace anytime I see it, uh, because it just represents uh, such an attractive wine. So we're going to move from Alsace now to the, to the west of the country. We're going uh, from all the way in the east to its furthest western point, at least in uh, metropolitan France, which is to say continental France. And we're going to uh, another famous wine region in the France, not so much because of their wine, which is indeed quite famous, but because of its port, Bordeaux, which is, uh, gives its name you know, to uh, this uh, region and uh, its famous wines. Bordeaux is an ideal port. It was uh, for a uh, uh, better part of two centuries, uh, France's most important commercial port on the Atlantic um, and uh, was always an important center for Catholicism. Uh, Bordeaux was the first major port you would come to if you were sailing from uh, the Western hemisphere or up from Africa uh, along the Atlantic coastline of Europe to France. And so uh, given that the French were always uh, at some point of losing a war against England, uh, which had uh, naval domination, uh, ships that were trying to make it to France from other parts of the world would uh, clock in at the nearest port that they could get to, and that would be Bordeaux. So for uh, reasons of their fabulous wine production, this is perhaps the most famous wine production area of France, and because of its commercial uh, significance, um, it is uh, a key point to leave France. Uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic faith has always been particularly strong in uh, Western and Northwestern France and in Eastern France in Alsace. And so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the Spiritans uh, would have had a major presence there. But more directly, this would have uh, typically been the departure point for uh, a great number of Spiritans uh, over 300 years from France who are leaving for their missions in other parts of the world, but most importantly and directly those coming to North America. So we now talk about a, a Bordeaux wine, which gives us the chance uh, to uh, taste um, a wine of significance to the Spiritans from a region that certainly figures prominently in the history of the congregation in France. Before we do that though, let's try to understand Bordeaux production. And uh, again, this, this may be familiar to some of you, but in case it's not, uh, there's a little map there of uh, the Bordeaux region and uh, uh, its, uh, its, its neighboring production areas. Um, if, uh, if you're able to go a little bit there towards the south and the center, of that picture, uh, you know, right where you see it says Cadillac and uh, Sauternes. Uh, that's where the city of Bordeaux is about. Uh, it's a little bit up from that, perhaps. So uh, you actually have to go up the Gironde River for uh, a fair distance uh, past these exquisite wine production areas on either side of the river. Um, there are two distinct types of Bordeaux. Um, there, uh, there's the so-called left bank, which is the west bank. That tends to be narrow 
Um, it's hemmed in closely by mountains uh, and uh, has a very particular type of soil. And then there's a much larger right bank that um, is the Eastern bank. And although it's hilly, uh, there are no mountains there and uh, you've got a lot more land uh, to uh, spread out with. Um, for the most part, uh, Bordeaux wines, if they're not named as a village, uh, Appellation uh, d'Origine Controle, AOC, then the grapes are, they have to be from the region of Bordeaux. Um, and sometimes, actually, if, you, if, uh, if you're lucky, they'll be from the actual chateau, which uh, will only produce a certain number of bottles of wine under its own name. And if they had a bumper crop, uh, they'll uh, produce the rest of their uh, wine uh, and just call it uh, Bordeaux or Bordeaux Superior without the chateau name being ascribed to it, or they'll have a different chateau name mentioned there. But sometimes if you, if you do your research, you know, you can get some of the most famous chateau of the area. Uh, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're sort of secondary wines, uh, even though they're exactly the same grapes from the same year um, that are uh, in bottles that might be selling for hundreds of dollars, and you're able to uh, pick it up uh, for uh, quite a bit less. So this is, this is uh, a Bordeaux uh, wine per se. Uh, it's a generic Bordeaux wine. Uh, it comes from Chateau Guizzo but it is not itself uh, a wine that is uh, specifically associated with uh, a particular village. So uh, it comes from the winery, but it does not come from a specific village. Um, this is 100% uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, though it's been cut a little bit with Muscadel, uh, probably for reasons of sweetness. Muscadel is a sweeter grape and uh, they probably wanted to raise the sugars somewhat. Um, it's part of a, a six chateau holding uh, from the uh, Petit family. Um, I gave the, the French uh, name there, uh, Famille Petit, just because Petit family just sounds too close to the English, uh, so that you might think it was a, a, a small family, which, as it turns out, with six chateaux, it isn't. Uh, this is uh, a consortium that's undergoing a conversion to organic production. Um, which is a whole other form of accreditation uh, for French wine production, but it is not yet an organic winery. So these uh, may be some organic grown grapes, but some of them uh, are doubtless were used by traditional uh, production methods, uh, which may or may not have involved some, some uh, uh, insecticides. Uh, the grapes for this wine are completely hand harvested. Uh, that's always a good sign. It means the wine is being very uh, carefully crafted. Uh, this had to be aged for eight to 10 months, uh, mostly on its leaves. So uh, that should give it a little bit of color uh, and uh, another explanation uh, as to the uh, potency and the strength of the wine. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd just like to call to your attention here is this is a famous Bordeaux Blanc, which is to say a white wine for Bordeaux. Bordeaux is, is, is pretty much famous for its red wines. Uh, there's very little white wine production generally, and most of that is sweet wine. The famous Bordeaux Sauternes um, are world uh, class and famous. But uh, Bordeaux Blancs uh, tend to, uh, you know, they're sort of like um, uh, the AAA uh, team of uh, the Bordeaux region. They're, they're not that famous, uh, and uh, the more famous wines are going to be the Chardonnays that come from the Loire, for example. But I, I think that they are a great, great bargain. I think they are delicious wine um, and they have merits all on their own uh, that um, happily uh, have not yet caught on. And uh, you can drink some of the best, the absolute best of the Bordeaux white wines uh, at uh, an incredibly affordable price. Uh, to be a little bit more granular with this wine, um, let's talk about its virtues such as they are. Uh, it's described as tasting of white flowers, green fruits, and lemongrass, a flinty, crisp character that lingers, make it a choice uh, for robust fish and salad dishes. Um, this, is, uh, this is a great, crisp wine. I, I tend to think of, uh, of Bordeaux white wines, the dry wines, as sort of being like uh, appreciating a pill's uh, you know, uh, or a lager compared to these uh, other types of um, uh, specialty beers. 
Um, it's a good, clean white wine. And uh, if, uh, if that's what you like in white wine, you will be very happy with just about any Bordeaux Blanc that's dry. Um, and, uh, and, and I think definitely this is a great entry there. Um, and I, I suspect uh, it, it's unappreciated quality is ripe for surprises. And I hope uh, tonight, if you're not familiar with Bordeaux Blanc, this uh, is an opportunity for you to explore these wines uh, further. So we still have uh, one more wine to talk about uh, in our class uh, of, um, of white wines, uh, but we're now we're going, we're going to move back to Alsace uh, uh, and uh, we've already had our little uh, primer there uh, on, on some of the qualities. Uh, but uh, let's just talk about the importance of uh, this province, Alsace, to the congregation. Along with Lorraine, which is uh, to its north and uh, also uh, one of those provinces that France and Germany, you know, went at one another, hammer and tongs uh, over in different wars, uh, they tended to switch sides. And after uh, the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, uh, Lorraine and uh, Alsace uh, got switched to Germany. Uh, but for the uh, congregation of the, of the Holy Ghost, this was uh, the, uh, the, the main source of priests. About one third to maybe 40% of the priests in the French province uh, came from this region. And uh, when uh, the, uh, the, the, the two provinces uh, were taken by Germany in uh, 1871, uh, the congregation there split. Uh, half of uh, those who were uh, lo uh, from Lorraine and Alsace, they went into Germany. They stayed, therefore, in the country and, uh, and they became German citizens. And then uh, the uh, other half, uh, you know, went directly to France. So uh, perhaps the greatest of the uh, superiors general of the congregation, uh, Father Ignatius Schwindenhammer, uh, himself was a, a German um, uh, of uh, Alsatian background. But uh, more importantly for Duquesne University, uh, Father Joseph Stroop, uh, who is uh, really the de facto founder of the university, uh, he was an Alsatian and a German uh, and a French citizen. He sort of had uh, you know, uh, his feet in, in both sides of the border. Uh, we got him because of, um, of this uh, famous presence of the church uh, in Alsace. Uh, many of you would remember uh, Father Strube's uh, statue right beside the chapel uh, by uh, our administration building. Uh, he doesn't have his statue on in that picture, but for much of COVID uh, pre-vaccine, he, uh, he did wear a mask. I just want to point that out. Um, there's a, a contemporary photograph of him and uh, the, his uh, birthplace. So we have an Alsatian white wine. And uh, our Alsatian white wine, though, uh, is not a live wine uh, like our Cremant was. It is a still wine. In this case, uh, it is uh, a Riesling uh, from uh, 2019. And lest you're a little gun shy about uh, such a recent wine, generally uh, uh, white wines are meant to be drunk young. There are some white wines, uh, particularly uh, the sweeter ones like a Sauterne, um, that uh, can, can be aged over uh, a great period of time. Uh, but uh, most white wines actually uh, pretty much shoot their bolt um, after uh, just a few years. Uh, you'd have to keep them almost perfectly to make them drinkable uh, for 10 years or out. So this one is uh, uh, from uh, Pfaff. Uh, Pfaff actually is a, a reference to a town called Pfaffenheim. Uh, you can see Pfaffenheim right there uh, to the right. And uh, the vineyard we're talking about, uh, uh, the, the Pfaff vineyard uh, is uh, right there uh, on the uh, picture to the very bottom of our screen. Um, when we talk about still wines from Alsace, it's a, actually quite a complicated subject uh, because uh, Alsace, uh, which is sort of on this uh, alluvial plain, uh, <clears throat> rising up from the Rhine River uh, and at the foot of the Alps, has a, a great deal of a variety in its soil types. So as you know, soil types are uh, often referred to as terroir. And uh, so the terroir really determine the quality and the type of the wine. And so every vineyard uh, in Alsace tends to be unique. Now, arguably everybody's vineyard is unique any place, any place in the world. 
But uh, in Alsace, this is uh, literally as well as figuratively true. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the Pfaff vineyard there, uh, in this case uh, from uh, um, Pfaffenheim, it's Cuvée Jupiter, uh, is, uh, is its, its own unique approach. Um, and the grape itself is pretty interesting. It's a Riesling. And uh, Riesling is a hardy grape, which is widely cultivated all around the world. There are Rieslings which are grown and made into wine right here in Pennsylvania. I'm talking to you from uh, Pennsylvania in case um, that one is news. And uh, there are Rieslings grown in California and there are Rieslings grown in South Africa and Rieslings grown in Austria and Germany and so forth. So uh, it's, uh, it is a certainly uh, a ubiquitous grape around the world and has the widest possible spectrum of sugar content of any grape. Um, or if it isn't the widest possible spectrum, it's gotta be number two. Uh, so much so that most people prefer sweet Rieslings, uh, particularly here in the United States. And they're quite popular with a large number of people. Um, so uh, they tend to be sweet, uh, and there are, there are a number of varieties of that, to demi-sec, which is uh, more or less sweet. Uh, this one is sec, which is to say dry, which is to say it's not sweet. Uh, it, will, it will drink like a regular dry white wine. There, there'll be a little bit more uh, spin on the baseball here in terms of sweetness, than most white wines. Certainly it will be a little sweeter than uh, the uh, Bordeaux Blanc that you may or may not have just tasted, but uh, not much. So this, uh, this uh, consortium, uh, Cuvée Jupiter, uh, was organized in 1955, again, for similar reasons to uh, what we talked about uh, for our, our previous Alsatian wine. And it's really gone through a major reorganization since. Uh, upgrading its equipment, um, improving its storage facilities and its aging facilities. So uh, this is actually a very nice Alsatian uh, producer. Um, anytime you see anything that says FAF um, in the wine store, uh, you're talking about one of the best producers in Alsace. So uh, some qualities of, uh, of this particular uh, wine that are worth noting uh, its official description uh, in, uh, in its, uh, its, its uh, winery tasting notes says that it's Casser, it's Lima, and it has its, uh, its Palm Granny Smith. So uh, Casser means uh, mineral tasting. Uh, actually, ironically, it's uh, limestone in the particular region of, uh, of this winery. So uh, you've got uh, a definitely a stony, flinty taste to it. Um, uh, uh, limestone has uh, its, its own particular unique feature. Uh, Lima here uh, is a reference literally to the citrus fruit lime. So it's got, uh, it's got sharp notes of citrus to it, but uh, softer ones uh, similar to a lime as, compo as compared to let's say a lemon or a grapefruit. Uh, and uh, it's both sweet and tart at the same time. That's basically what a Granny Smith apple reference would make. Bit ironic, given that uh, in in the uh, French tasting notes they would be uh, actually comparing it to a non-French apple. Uh, it's modestly strong uh, with uh, uh, an ABV of twelve point eight percent. Different uh, different uh, readings may come up um, for this wine. Uh, generally, though, uh, twelve point eight percent is the official claim uh, for its uh, testing. So that's a pretty strong white wine and uh, a little bit up there for a Riesling, which can go as low as 10%. It's ready to drink right now, despite its year. And um, I, uh, I would predict that uh, you're having a happy experience if you happen to be drinking that wine right now. It actually won a bronze medal in 2020. Uh, not that uh, winning medals is it itself significant, but uh, it at least indicates that the uh, winery uh, thought the wine was good enough to put it up for a medal. Uh, Rieslings are world famous, actually, and this is the irony, particularly if they're sweet, uh, to, uh, to have with Asian food, even, even perhaps Indian food with a little curry. Uh, but this is a dry Riesling, uh, and uh, it would be especially uh, excellent with seafood and is <clears throat> particularly recommended with raw shellfish, uh, specifically oysters, which would be the most famous raw shellfish to eat. There are others, but probably not advisable to eat raw. But in this case, uh, uh, if you happen to be uh, a raw oyster uh, eating person, uh, this is one of the most famous wines uh, to have 
at least French whites to have with uh, an oyster. Um, but since it's Alsatian, uh, you really should be drinking it while you're eating Alsatian food. And although Chef has uh, given us uh, recommendations here, um, I love Alsatian food and uh, you really don't get a chance to uh, have exposure to it here in the United States. I feel compelled to talk about Alsatian food. Um, it's a uh, fusion cuisine, uh, as you can well imagine. You've got the Germans marching in from the east. Uh, you've got the, the French marching in from the West and every once in a while, the Swiss showed up uh, to uh, stir the pot. So, uh, you know, you've got a lot of different cuisines here and, uh, and, and they're, it's really one of the most delicious and I think the least known of the uh, various uh, sub cuisines of France. Um, it, this, uh, this wine would go great with Becca coffee, which is, uh, which is a, a meat pie, you know, for lack of anything better, I'd say it's a, single crust uh, stew of chicken or of uh, beef, which is uh, served in a Dutch oven. Uh, Coco van in the Alsatian uh, form is always made with Riesling wine, dry Riesling wine. So this is precisely the sort of wine you would use to make authentic Alsatian Coco van. Um, but it is a famous wine to drink with the two most famous dishes of Alsace, uh, Charcut Garni and uh, Flamkuka. Charcut Garni, literally fancy sauerkraut, um, it's the dish on the lower left, is uh, a large amount of sauerkraut, not cooked in the Pittsburgh fashion, right? Which is to saute it with butter. So it's tart, sour sauerkraut in, uh, in, a, in a, big, uh, a, a big tureen or a big Dutch oven uh, in which you nestle uh, bockwurst or uh, thick, um, thick German sausages similar to uh, what we would we would call hot dogs here, but bockwurst or knockwurst, I think, would be the closest thing. Uh, smoked pork belly, which is the basis of bacon, potatoes, um, <clears throat> other smoked sausages, and maybe a liver dumpling. Um, uh, smoked pork chops would perhaps be the most famous element uh, in uh, in the, the, the charcuterie, and this is cooked for hours together. Uh, and uh, when the char when the, the, the sauerkraut comes out. Um, it, uh, it has all the infusion of the meat flavors, and it's a, it's a pretty rib-sticking famous dish from that region. Flamkuka is, uh, is basically a, a personal pizza. Uh, instead of putting a, a tomato sauce on it, you, you put um, um, kind of a, a, a derivation of, uh, of sour cream. It's called creme fraiche, um, and then slices of aromatic uh, sausage or bacon. Uh, very similar to prosciutto uh, in the, in the uh, in France, they were called them lardon, and uh, that's cooked and is just absolutely scrumptious. And uh, again, this is the wine you would drink with that. Um, but uh, just keep in mind that since most of the wines of Assas are white, um, they would have many surprising pairings uh, to our own experience here uh, and our understanding of wines uh, in the United States. So that's, uh, that's going to close our discussion of white wines. Uh, now our remaining uh, four wines are going to be from uh, the red uh, persuasion. And our next lesson about the, the spiritins is going to be related to this subject of dealing with red wines. Um, there, are, there are two uh, relatively uh, well-known, at least uh, in, uh, in theological circles, um, uh, kind of uh, fallacies uh, or um, uh, for, uh, forbidden tendencies within the church that uh, develop uh, in the, uh, the, the, from the 1500s on, let's say. They're called Gallicanism and Jansenism. Uh, Gallicanism uh, is uh, a kind of almost a precursor to the Protestant Reformation. It was the argument that the uh, church in France uh, should be just governed by France, that uh, there was uh, no need uh, to make any um, uh, cooperative uh, or uh, otherwise submissive relationship with uh, the Pope in Rome. So it, it's, it's national rule of the church as opposed to universal uh, governance of the church, uh, to make a long story short. Jansenism, which is a reference uh, to a theologian of, uh, of the, uh, the Baroque era, uh, is dealing with somebody uh, who had a, a particularly uh, severe viewpoint on life, um, on uh, spirituality, 
on sexuality. Um, and uh, it was uh, an austere, an incredibly austere approach uh, to Christianity. And uh, in, in a sense, uh, Jansenism is sometimes called Catholic Calvinism or Catholic Presbyterianism. It was, a, it was a very, very different approach to the kind of uh, sunny wine drinking uh, Mediterranean uh, notion of Rome, whereas, uh, you know, you're moving north, Jansen himself uh, was from uh, the so-called low countries that, uh, you know, you got uh, a, a much more frosty, literally frosty approach uh, to Christianity. Um, in any case, um, uh, there, there is a division that develops uh, within the uh, Catholic Church. It's sometimes called the Western Schism, um, in which uh, a rival papacy is set up in France uh, because of uh, the French king's Gallican tendencies. Um, the, uh, that, that papacy is set up uh, in uh, the medieval French town of Avignon, which is in south central France. And uh, uh, because it becomes an important center of uh, Christianity in Western Europe, particularly French Christianity, uh, you have a large uh, surge of people and a number of vineyards are planted uh, so that these people can have wine. Uh, the Avignon papacy uh, is from 1309 to 1378. Uh, it, um, it will be solved for uh, by a union and the, uh, the, the Western schism is, uh, is, is, is finally healed, presumably, at 1417, but really not. Um, the, the, those kinds of arguments uh, persist uh, for another 100 years and will actually f uh, become uh, fully fruited um, in the Protestant Reformation. In any case, uh, because of this kind of divisiveness, uh, the congregation gets founded. We're founded by that French uh, nobleman from Brittany. His name is Claude Poulart de Place. Uh, there's, uh, there's a painting of him there on the lower right-hand side. <clears throat> and de Place specifically founds his congregation in 1703 as a reaction to the hyper-nationalistic uh, uh, Gallican tendencies of Roman Catholicism uh, in his uh, country at the time. He wants his congregation to be loyal to Rome. He wants it to do the sorts of work that the Pope wants to have done. And uh, he does not hold with Gallicanism. And uh, although by our standards today, he'd be a pretty conservative person, <clears throat> he specifically repudiates the extremism of Jansen's, Jansenism as well. So in no small measure, the congregation uh, comes to be because of the wildness of Gallicanism and Jansenism. Um, and of course, much of this gets its start in one shape or form at the uh, Avignon papacy. Happily for us, another thing gets its start at the Avignon papacy, uh, and that's going to be the establishment of uh, some of the, uh, the greatest vineyards in the world, and some of the truly greatest vineyards in France. Collectively, uh, that region is now known as Chateauneuf du Pape, which literally means the new castle of the Pope. We just saw a picture of the Pope's new castle in the previous slide. And so these are some of the most famous wines uh, that you can drink in France and uh, are consistently, I think, uh, some of the highest quality wines. In fact, I'd say they are most consistently the highest quality wine, which is produced in the country. Uh, pretty much, uh, if you like Chateau Neuf de Pop, no matter what the year, you're probably going to get a good bottle. So let's uh, say a few general words about Chateau Neuf de Pop. Uh, <clears throat> they tend to be pretty pricey wines. And uh, I have to tell you, I was pretty uh, delighted and amazed uh, to see that uh, we were able to pick up these wines for under $30, each one of them. Typically, you don't see that. Uh, frankly, if you can get a Chateau Neuf de Pop under $30, um, in my mind, um, that's a birthday present. But more directly, uh, these wines tend to run for between $50 to $125 a bottle. Um, and uh, uh, for good reason, once you begin to drink them. Uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop is not a big region. Uh, it uh, is five villages only, and uh, that's uh, larger than your typical uh, Appellation, but still, uh, given the demand for these wines, uh, it's still pretty limited. Uh, uh, to make this wine, you're permitted 13 different grapes that can be there uh, and blended in any shape or form. 
though uh, most of these wines are Grenache, uh, although uh, they're blended with uh, a healthy amount of Syrah and a little bit of Morvedre, which again is a little, uh, a, a small sweet grape, and they tend to be dominant. Uh, they're famous for their intense fruit taste, uh, and they can be, they can be very different uh, in uh, their impact. Some can be very soft, uh, some come out with very strong tannins from the grape skins, uh, but uh, they're, they're all capable of many years of aging, which is one of the nice things about these wines. And uh, you can uh, put up a bottle of this if you store it rightly uh, and drink it 20 years later and be a very happy camper. Uh, typically, they have uh, tasting notes of, uh, of dark fruits, you know, prunes, stewed fruit, truffles, uh, 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 warm spices, uh, even, even cocoa. Um, and the other thing that's a tip off about these wines is uh, they're all distinctive. They all have to have the same bottle type and uh, uh, printed on the bottle is always going to be uh, a glass uh, embossment of the papal coat of arms. So uh, you can always tell if it's a true Chateau Neuf de Pop, no matter what they put on the wine etiquette, if it doesn't have a bottle that looks like that, it's not that. So we have three wines and the reason why we have three wines, we had originally had, uh, had two wines, but uh, one of them sold out so quickly that uh, in, in order to guarantee that everybody would have access to at least uh, two Chateau Neuf du Pop wines, uh, uh, we uh, proposed uh, a, a third wine, thus bringing us from the typical six wines for a wine tasting to seven. Um, but uh, if you didn't get all three of the, uh, the uh, Chateau Neuf du Pop wines, um, uh, hopefully uh, you'll have some pleasure with uh, the two that you have. So uh, the, the first one is uh, 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 from Cleft uh, de Saint Thomas. It's uh, uh, called, as a specific name, Pierre Tupel. Uh, this is a pretty small vineyard of about 27 acres. Uh, it was bought in 2006 uh, by a, a French uh, winemaker named Philippe Kessler. Um, and his wife, Sophie, who you can see there on the left, manages these vineyards uh, for him. Um, this particular wine, though, is in homage to her grandfather, hence it has the name Pierre Troupel. Uh, he was famous um, for uh, a number of things, but um, his, his eyes were famously blue, a light colored blue. And um, that's why the etiquette for this uh, wine bottle uh, is typically blue uh, or a light blue uh, to uh, evoke uh, her father, her grandfather's famous blue eyes. Um, he also made uh, uh, a blue cheese, uh, one of the famous local blue cheeses of the region. Uh, but what this wine is particularly famous for is uh, an incredibly classic terroir of large stones. In fact, if you can see, the vineyard uh, in the lower left-hand side there, you can see the large size stones, which of course, during uh, sunlight are gonna get warm. They're gonna retain the heat. Um, it allows these uh, vines to be uh, much more hardy uh, and produce a much more robust uh, wine as a consequence. Uh, for this wine's particular virtue, it's described as having a pretty juiciness, uh, straightforward wine, clean, sweet fruit, very accessible and enjoyable as of now. I think you will agree with that, um, especially if you've had a chance uh, to either aerate or decant the wine or let it breathe. Uh, these grapes are not only hand-picked, but they're also destemmed before the grapes are crushed. This is a deliberate technique to keep the wine uh, from, from having too much tannins in it. Uh, and that's why uh, you can describe it as being juicy because you're not tasting the crushed stems of the grapes as well. Um, it's variously rated in the low 90s professionally. I think it might be as high as 93 points, as low as 90 points. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see the, uh, the town right there of, uh, uh, from the uh, wines production. And then just below it, on the other side of the town, you can see the vineyard itself. It's really a, a delicious wine. The second uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop uh, has uh, a little more legs on it, uh, 2016, um, and uh, it, it actively boasts it comes from Ve Vigna, meaning old vines. Uh, more on this in a moment. That usually is a good mark when, uh, when you have that in the production of the wine. 
Uh, this chateau is very interesting. Uh, it has been a wine producing uh, uh, facility which goes back to the 16th century. So there, there are 500 years plus producing wine in this exact location. Um, it's uh, currently produced by a, a fairly large consortium uh, dedicated uh, to uh, production of Rhone wines in general. This is Chateauneuf de Pop is considered a Rhone wine. Um, and uh, they have holdings uh, all up and down the Northern and Southern Rhone. So uh, this is a major production from a major wine producer. Um, I would say if you're drinking both of these wines, it's definitely a bolder Chateau Neuf du Pop. <clears throat> I say it's it's more there. Uh, it's it's a much better uh, example of uh, of what this wine can previous can do, uh, and especially the previous entry, uh, not just because of the year, but I think just because of the nature of uh, the chateau itself. Um, there's a, a a picture there of Andreas Larsen. Uh, who I think is a Danish uh, uh, wine critic. Um, you can actually find uh, a really great YouTube video about this wine uh, where uh, Larson speaks about it. And um, happily, he's not saying anything that's contradicting what I'm about to say. So this wine's virtues, if uh, we can talk about them. Uh, well, number one, it won a gold medal. So uh, anytime you can pick up a gold medal wine, it's a Chateau Neuf de Pape, it's under $30. It's your birthday. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, a terrific, terrific wine. Uh, it has 92 points. So uh, it, uh, it's, it's not at the 100 point level, but it does have that gold medal. Uh, its color is, is really beautiful. Uh, it's a deeper color uh, than uh, our previous entry. Um, it's clear, uh, it's, it's a limpid garnet. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's like, uh, like the gemstone. It just shines uh, with that combination of red and orange. It has a very elegant nose, uh, and uh, I think you'll be able to pick up notes of cherry and coffee with it. Uh, on your tongue, it'll finish very smoothly. Um, and yet it still is dry. So, you know, it's, this is this is not a wine that is uh, is uh, is sweet by any means. Um, in many ways, I'd say this is the best wine of the night. And uh, and I think um, if you were able to get this bottle, um, you uh, you're very, very uh, happy right now if you're drinking it. So we have a third Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, this one was uh, proposed. Uh, to uh, make up for the fact that uh, we were selling out of the others. Um, and given the structure of trying to organize this involving a third party, there was just no way to get around it. So uh, if you got all three, uh, you, have a, you have a really great night tonight. If, um, if you got uh, only one of the other two, um, then uh, I think you'll enjoy this one very much. This is uh, Chateau Fagarol, uh, and it's from uh, 2017. This is a great backstory to this uh, vineyard, and uh, it's the sort of thing that uh, makes uh, doing wine tastings and then drinking these wines um, so remarkable. Um, the story is that the family that owns this vineyard and produces this wine is seven generations doing this job. Uh, the seventh generation, I'm sure, are those uh, fat little toddlers being held in the uh, center picture. I don't think uh, you know they're uh, doing much for wine, but I bet you they're drinking the grape juice. Um, the family is called the Revoltier family, and they themselves go back in this region since 1340, uh, though they haven't been producing wine since 1340, but they have lived and worked in this region uh, for almost uh, 700 years. Um, it's a fairly large holding, about 80 plus acres, which occurs in several locations, but some of the most choice spots in Chateau Neuf du Pop. So uh, some of the absolute best uh, area in which to grow grapes. Uh, and I think you can see the uh, grandfather there in the center with his uh, two grandsons is uh, from this vineyard. So it's an excellent wine with an excellent backstory. Um, what are its particular virtues? Uh, well, it's got a peerless pedigree. It, honest to goodness, is truly um, uh, one of the best stories you can come up with in a wine uh, uh, possible. Uh, it's a classic blend, uh, absolutely classic blend. 70% Grenache, 20% Syrah. That's where the classic point comes in. In this case, it's 5% Morvedra and 5% uh, uh, Cinso. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's well within what your typical uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop would be. Uh, it tastes of Kirsch cherries, which is to say the types of cherries we make uh, liqueurs out of. Damson plums, savory herbs, licorice, uh, hints of damp earth. Uh, not surprising, uh, it's our highest rated red wine of the night at 94 points professionally. So um, I hope uh, you uh, taste it and you enjoy it. I think it deserves those 94 points. I think the story about that family deserves 100 points. And uh, we should have a word about food since we did spend so much time talking about Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, this, is a, this is a fairly expensive wine. Uh, for us tonight, uh, nobody uh, had to pay, uh, you know, beyond uh, the mid twenties for these wines. Uh, depending on where you are, you uh, you pay tax, um, but um, still, that's a, that's a pretty approachable wine for such a very famous and excellent wine. But uh, these are complex and strong wines, and uh, it is not unusual that people who really love them don't blink an eye at paying top dollar for them. The point is, these complex wines can truly take on complex food, uh, and uh, and and probably are you, you know you, again this is not a wine to drink with pizza. Uh, it, uh, it it it's not supposed to be with um, with things that are that strong, but it can certainly take on some pretty strong foods. Um, it generally does well with Mediterranean spices, but you wouldn't want to take this wine with um, the lighter colored meats. Um, so you, you wouldn't serve this wine with maybe turkey, typically, or uh, chicken. Uh, but this is a great wine to have with uh, things that uh, would be like a very classic, powerful stew, like beef bourguignon. Or you would have this with duck or with goose uh, or with venison. Not that a lot of people eat venison. But I would say um, a lot of people do eat venison uh, if you're, you come from a hunting family. So uh, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out what to serve, uh, you know, with all that venison that you're stuck uh, eating, this is, uh, this is a, a great uh, wine to have with that. It, it's also great with some of those softer, stinky cheeses that you can find uh, that come from France. They are the, they are the best of their cheeses. And uh, this is the type of wine you'd serve with that. So it's, uh, it's an assertive wine. It's capable of standing up to assertive food. So we're, we're moving to our end now, and um, uh, we're, we're returning to Bordeaux, and we've already had our, our little thoughts uh, about uh, where that fits into the congregation. But I'd like to talk a little bit more about Bordeaux wines, just so you understand um, the, the nature and quality of the wine that you're about to taste, if that's what you have. <clears throat> so I already mentioned to you that uh, sometimes when Chateau uh, overproduce grapes and they don't want to produce any more bottles of wine under their own name. Uh, they uh, mass market them uh, and then they're produced with uh, out a, a specific name, like it won't say Saint Julien or won't say Mouly on the etiquette. It'll just say Bordeaux or Bordeaux Superior. So uh, if it says Bordeaux, it means the grapes must be from the Bordeaux region. If it says Bordeaux Superior, which is what the wine we're about to drink will say, uh, they're better quality grapes and they have to come from uh, other qualities. So they have to be older vines. They can't be young vines. They have to be densely planted uh, vineyards. Uh, so they can't obviously be young vineyards. Uh, they have to have a certain ripeness of the fruit and the natural sugar levels upon harvest have to be at a certain uh, qualitative minimum. Um, you have to have lower harvest yields. So, uh, you know, Bordeaux Superior is not going to be a bumper crop, typically. Uh, they have to be a minimum of 10.5% ABV in, in alcohol. Uh, generally, uh, most uh, Bordeaux that are drinkable, you would never take them below 13%. Um, and uh, they have to stay in the barrel aging for at least 12 months. Um, so that's the requirement uh, to have a Bordeaux Superior wine, which is actually this one right here. And uh, this is a really, this is a really uh, excellent wine. And if, um, if, uh, if, if we already have had uh, in uh, our uh, Chateau Neuf de Pape uh, entry, the best wine of the night, this is, I think, uh, the best bargain of the night. 
Um, this is a trade war wine, and uh, so it's uh, very potent. Uh, uh, trade war wines are a relatively recent uh, phrase. They describe the trade embargo that President Trump slapped on the European Union because of uh, their huge trade surpluses uh, with the United States. So um, uh, to get around that, uh, the original uh, uh, sanction said that uh, there had to be a tax on uh, any wine which was 13% uh, 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 or below. So uh, typically Bordeaux's 13.5%. Uh, Typically, Bordeaux's are, are made in that range. So what the, uh, what the producers started to do was they made them much higher alcoholic content, um, which uh, greatly increased um, their joy point, I think. And um, uh, this, uh, this sort of uh, is only for a few years. Uh, I think they're still producing them that way because I don't know that the trade sanctions have been lifted by the Biden administration yet. But uh, so it's a trade war wine. It definitely is not your typical 13, 13.5% alcohol Bordeaux. Um, and it's a, a superior, which we've already established, uh, meaning uh, it's, it's higher quality of grapes, but it's also a reserve, which means that the winemaker has specific reasons to say this wine is better. Either the preparation was different or it stayed longer in the barrels, uh, or uh, in uh, his or her subjective opinion, uh, the grapes were particularly excellent, uh, the sugar levels were better, but a reserve almost always is a tip off that it is uh, the, 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 the selection specifically of the winemaker and, and is expected to be notably better. Uh, this is a big producer. Uh, they produce about 120,000 bottles of wine uh, from uh, this, uh, this general uh, producer at uh, the, uh, the family Alain uh, Aubert. But uh, nonetheless, uh, they've, uh, they've been around a long time. The Auberts have been in the uh, winemaking business in Bordeaux since the 17th century. So uh, this is uh, not the sorts of people who are gonna make a low quality wine to mass produce something. Uh, even though they produced a lot of bottles, uh, they produced a lot of good bottles. Uh, but one big point with this wine, um, if you're going to uh, drink it, um, <clears throat> typically just because it's so recent, 2018, for those you do have to age for about 10 years. Uh, that's when they really reach their full quality. So uh, if you're going to drink the wine early, and I, I think I mentioned this in your tasting notes, you really should aerate it. You can buy an implement that uh, forces the wine uh, to travel through a, a couple of um, uh, uh, little uh, loops, as it were, so that it can it can you can put more oxygen into the wine to take off its uh, hardness of the tannins. Um, even better, decant it, pour it out of the bottle uh, into a decanter or a pitcher, um, and then uh, above all, let it breathe in that format for as long as possible certainly two hours. Uh, probably this wine is at its best to be drunk from 2022, but I thought it uh, really did represent uh, a wonderful example of an extremely approachable red Bordeaux uh, classic wine. So uh, just our last slide, this wine's virtues. Um, uh, it's a trade war wine. So, uh, you know, 14.5% uh, ABV, um, Bordeaux's are never produced that strongly. They just aren't. The fact that uh, you've got such a powerful and a potent wine uh, is extraordinarily unusual from Bordeaux. Uh, and it's not the only wine like that from Bordeaux, uh, but uh, it's not going to stay this way once those sanctions are lifted. So uh, enjoy uh, this kind of trade war Bordeaux situation while it lasts. Um, at uh, Given what it is, uh, given its quality, uh, given its producer, I think it's a bargain. It's, uh, it is definitely the, the, the best wine for the price tonight. Uh, it's a, a pretty classic blend uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. Um, those are the classic blends of uh, Bordeaux reds, Bordeaux rouges. But what's amazing about this is uh, that actually the dominant grape is Cabernet Franc. So you're, you, you could probably go 10 years, 20 years, and never drink another red Bordeaux where the majority grape is Cabernet Franc. This is a unique production 
uh, just for this year from this producer. And uh, not only that, but the Cabernet Franc vines are all a century old. Um, that's pretty much breathtaking. Uh, it is extraordinarily uncommon to have that distinction for a wine. So there are so many production values that speak to this wine. And given its price, uh, I think it's just an amazing uh, opportunity. And uh, it is not only uh, the heaviest wine for tonight, but uh, it probably is the most interesting wine tonight for us to close with. So thanks so much for your time here. Uh, in the Spiritans, uh, we often use this phrase, ad multos anos, meaning uh, many years of uh, happiness and good fortune. And um, thanks so much uh, for uh, your uh, continued interest in Duquesne University, uh, for your support of our university, and uh, above all, for your faithfulness to the traditions of the Spiritans, uh, which come through our university of one heart and one spirit. I understand that if you uh, have any questions, uh, they have either been previously submitted or they have uh, been put on to the chat function. And uh, Jonathan, who is the uh, president of uh, our alumni association, is going to feed them to me. Yeah, thanks so much, Father. This was incredible. I was taking a ton of notes here myself as we, as we went here uh, this evening. Uh, I had a couple of questions that came in, though, from the audience. Um, you know, first of which, they said, I'm, I'm a huge Pinot Noir fan. What's the best reasonably priced Pinot that you have had and from what region? Well, Pinot Noir is widely produced in France. <clears throat> in fact, uh, Pinot Noir is, is going to be, uh, you know, very notable for uh, the um, uh, the, the, the northern uh, 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 Rhone wines and, uh, and uh, you know, the wines that you're going to pick up from Burgundy. So, uh, you know, if you want to talk about the classic French Pinot Noirs, you're talking about the wines uh, from Burgundy, <clears throat> which, uh, which, which are altogether different than the Pinot Noir produced anywhere else in the world. However, for myself, if we're still talking about Pinot Noirs in France, um, they actually make a, a they make one red wine in Alsace. It's a it's a Pinot Noir, and it is extremely difficult to find. Um, amazingly, the state stores here in Pennsylvania uh, uh, frequently will carry a uh, a Pinot Noir from Alsace, and uh, and I always find those wines delicious. Although I think they they require a little bit of age. Um, but if um, if I were going to identify my favorite Pinot Noir. It actually uh, would neither be Burgundy, which I don't drink that much because those wines actually are even more expensive than uh, the Chateau Neuf de Pop, um, or from Alsace, because they're pretty tough to find. It is very hard to find an Alsatian uh, Pinot Noir here in the United States. But actually, uh, Oregon Pinot Noirs are delicious. Uh, Oregon is sort of uh, yeah, making, it, making Pinot Noir their jam. And... I think uh, the best Pinot Noirs produced in the United States now are not coming from California where they uh, used to be, they're coming from Oregon. Oh, that's really, really, really interesting. Um, let me see, another question that came in here. Um, we had an attendee that said that they weren't able to obtain the Dupont, but they found a Telegram Chateau Neuf that is excellent. Do you have any familiarity with that particular product or any comments surrounding you know, oh yeah yeah view telegram um that's uh that's a famous producer uh it's uh in in, fr in france in the uh, chateau neuf uh, region and uh high quality uh, i don't think there are low quality uh wines from chateau neuf to pop the, the the land is too valuable uh the reputation is too fragile uh if uh, if you're not able to produce to standard uh, you'll lose uh, your license so there's no such thing as a bad Chateau Neuf de Pop in the normal course of events. Uh, it might not be stored properly and it'd go bad, but it wasn't bad when it went into the bottle, that's for sure. So uh, yeah, View Tele uh, uh, Telegraph is a, a very famous, uh, very famous wine from Chateau Neuf de Pop. Gotcha. Um, I had a couple questions related to just kind of the, the proximity of where you know, we were focused primarily on French wines this evening. Are there any other wines that you could think of that would be representative of the spirits that aren't necessarily French? Oh, sure. Uh, we were uh, limited by time here. Um, 
my, my goal was to finish this in uh, between uh, 60 and uh, 75 minutes. But uh, we could talk about uh, German wine production, uh, because remember, the, uh, the, the French province gets split uh, and they get tossed into Germany in 1871. Uh, we could be talking about quite a few Italian wines. Uh, the Spiritans don't have an Italian province, but uh, we have a great deal of uh, interests in Italy. And, uh, and obviously, um, we could talk about uh, the wine producing areas uh, of France that we didn't deal with that have a Spiritan connection and the countries in the world where the Spiritans are well represented. So obviously the United States, most specifically in California and Texas, and um, there's wine production in Texas actually, uh, but uh, a few other countries, the one that most dramatically comes to mind and has delicious wines would be South Africa, where the Spiritans have a major presence. You know, one, uh, one last question that came in here, um, Kind of interesting. Yeah, as part of their daily work, are you aware of any of the spirit and fathers that were involved in the cultivation of any of the vineyards or production of wine, um, or as uh, you know, Paul put, the consumption of its output? <laughs> well, certainly, uh, spiritans are involved in the consumption of wine. Um, I know that to be a fact. Uh, in, in terms of actually owning a vineyard, uh, no, the spiritans don't have their own vineyards. Many of uh, our French priests, however, have come from famous wine producing families. And at our mother house in Paris, it is a routine event that um, you'll sit down to dinner and the superior will stand up, you know, that mother house has got a, a big dining area because you could have anywhere from 50 to 100 uh, people there at any given day for a meal. And uh, the superior will stand up and say, you know, we would like to thank, uh, 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 Father uh, Rene, uh, whose uh, family has brought us the wine uh, for tonight's meal from their vineyard. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the wine is so-so. Sometimes it's from a left bank small village uh, in, uh, in the Bordeaux region or uh, someplace uh, in the, the northern Rhone. And uh, there's no way you would even touch these bottles. They're all sold privately to subscribers and they never even make it to the market, but uh, the family has brought several cases uh, for the congregation for that day. So um, the times that I experienced that at our mother house in Paris, I can tell you were choice. Well, you know, thank you, Father John, for all of your wonderful insight here tonight on, on these wines and for just sharing your knowledge of the spiritans with us as well. I really think that everybody who's here for the presentation today is going to, you know, I know myself, I found it really, really interesting. Uh, I want to thank everybody, all of our alumni, all of our friends for attending tonight's virtual wine tasting. Uh, I know that Sarah put in the chat again, uh, just a reminder to be sure to send photos from the, your, your participation in the tasting this evening uh, to alumni online at duquesne.edu. Um, she was able to secure uh, you know, the best photo from the evening is going to get a Duquesne jigsaw puzzle and it'll be sent, out, sent your way. Uh, so please be sure to share your photos here uh, for that. Uh, you'll also be getting a follow-up email from tonight's presentation uh, to get a copy of the recording, just so that way you have it for your reference and, and to utilize in the future. Um, and in that email, there's also going to be some additional ways for you to get involved with alumni here at Duquesne, both virtually and as we start to move more and more into in-person sorts of events. So, you know, appreciate everyone's participation from around the country here uh, tonight. Uh, thank you again, Father John, for uh, for your time and your expertise here. And have a have a great weekend. Stay safe, and as always, go Dukes.